Good afternoon. Welcome to our session today. We're just going to wait a minute or so as people are coming on in. So as we're coming in, why don't you take a few seconds and in the chat box, why don't you tell me what the weather is like where you are right now? See plenty of sunny, yay. A couple people with some snow. Everything from 50s to 80s. Nice. Oh, 80 in Northern California. I think they're a little warmer than us today, which is a little unusual. Another snowy. Ooh, 90 in LA. Okay, so heating up. I think we're kind of skipping spring a little bit, it looks like. We'll just wait another second or so. Hello and welcome to the second session for Explore SDSU 2021. International Programs and Study Abroad at SDSU. So this session uh, is about student voices and perspectives. So I was really curious what the weather was like where you are. Um, in San Diego, it's currently 70 degrees and sunny. So something to look forward to if you decide to join us at San Diego State. All right, so uh, who here came to the first session that we did last month? Do you wanna go ahead and raise your hand if you were in our first session? which was an overview of the different types of programs and scholarships and financial aid. we will see in some, a few hands raised. Excellent, excellent. So this session, we're actually gonna listen to a few students. And so you'll get some firsthand experiences uh, to learn from. So to let you know, we are recording this session and the first session was also recorded and you can find it on our YouTube channel SDSU Global Education, if you wanna go back and view that first recording. And for this session, we're also using the live transcription. Um, so if you're seeing some, the captions, the live transcription, please know that this is automated. Uh, we are not typing as we're talking. So I think it really comes down to how well we're enunciating. So uh, thank you for your patience with that. So this is a webinar and we are using the Q&A function. So please go ahead and type your questions in um, to the Q&A chat. And so let's go ahead and get started. So again, welcome to SDSU and congratulations on your admittance to hopefully be in Aztec for life. Uh, my name is Leti Kahia. I am a global education advisor in the Global Education Office um, under International Affairs. And this is my colleague, Ryan, who will introduce himself. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I guess for those of you that are in the Western US uh, and uh, good day to those of you that are in other regions. Uh, my name is Ryan McLemore. Uh, I am also a global education advisor in the Global Education Office, working closely with Letty and uh, advising students about so many uh, international experiences they're having. Happy to be here. And I'll hand it to Jessica. Hey there, everyone. Welcome again um, to our second Explore event for Study Abroad. My name is Jessica Bam, and I'm an International Programs Coordinator, um, specifically within the College of Arts and Letters. So if you are going to be um, in Cal, the College of Arts and Letters, we are the Social Sciences and Humanities. You might be working with me in the future, but I also work with lots of students across campus, um, developing faculty-led programs, international internship programs, and I'm really excited to hopefully see some of you all on campus, hopefully this fall. Thank you. 
And so this session is we have a few students um, to talk about their experiences and we'll be covering topics ranging from preparation, financial planning, their experience while they were abroad, as well as looking ahead and how did their international experiences um, influence the, their trajectory. So Ryan's going to go ahead and give us a little bit of a brief overview before we introduce you to our student panelists. Uh, sure, I will uh, provide a, a brief overview of the international internship uh, category. Uh, San Diego State has a large number of approved international internship provider organizations and even uh, a unique internship program that's run entirely by San Diego State, uh, which you'll hear about as well. Uh, but these are opportunities for students to apply to uh, an outside organization that we work closely with or uh, through uh, an office at San Diego State and be placed into uh, an unpaid internship for that, that hands-on practical and uh, a career relevant uh, uh, work experience in an international uh, location. Uh, so it's a wonderful opportunity to combine an international experience with that uh, applied and practical and uh, uh, professionally relevant uh, work experience. Uh, people get internships in uh, many, many different fields, all relevant uh, if they prefer, uh, prefer to their major or their academic minor. Uh, so these are great opportunities. They range in length from uh, six to eight weeks in the summer to as long as a semester. Uh, so lots of uh, variation and duration there. And uh, uh, there are scholarships available to help students cover the cost of these internships. Uh, so really wonderful inter international internship options. And we'll show you how to search for these in our database uh, uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, do you want to switch to the next slide? Or are we switching to Grace? All right. Oh, and I'll let, uh, sorry, I'll let Grace uh, introduce herself uh, as a representative of a internship participant. Yeah, so I'll just briefly tell you guys about uh, my international internship. Um, I was part of the Munt Peace Fellowship Program, which was a fully funded program um, in Cambodia. And I believe there were five different um, categories. And I was in the education placement. I think there was also legal aid, um, an arts placement, medical placement, and um, sustainability placement. Um, but my role was with a People Improvement Organization, which is a NGO school in Cambodia, um, in Phnom Penh, the capital. And basically I taught a class of 71st grade boys. Um, I taught them English and I did that for eight weeks over the summer and it was an amazing experience. Thanks, Grace. Uh, the next uh, uh, couple of pro program types that we would like to introduce to you uh, are broadly our exchange programs. And these uh, are run in different organizations. So we have some exchange programs that are run and sponsored entirely by San Diego State. We also have some exchange programs that are run by the Cal State system. So the CSU IP or CSU exchange programs for any CSU student. Uh, there are also exchange programs through the nonprofit organization ICEP or International Student Exchange Program. Uh, we, San, San Diego State is a subscribing member of the ICEP consortium of uh, exchange institutions around the world. So we're really proud of that partnership. So all three of these categories, SQSU, CSU, and ICEP have exchange programs. And that means that students will pay their normal SQSU tuition and fees to participate in these programs and then they take 
courses, they simply enroll in courses at our partner universities overseas. So pay as issue tuition normally and enroll in courses abroad. Uh, and simultaneously, we receive uh, international students from these partner institutions that come to San Diego State. Uh, so exchange, uh, reciprocity in both directions. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity for our students to exchange places and experience our respective institutions. Um, there are a, hundred, uh, a few hundred exchange partner schools all around the world. Uh, so lots of options on every continent uh, out there. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for students to really be immersed, uh, culturally immersed, academically immersed in that host institution and local community. Um, and uh, also very affordable on average because students pay their normal SDSU or CSU tuition. Uh, and also their normal financial aid, loans, grants, scholarships will apply because they're paying SDSU tuition normally. Uh, there are also uh, what we call faculty-led programs. These are short-term programs that range roughly from about two weeks to uh, uh, four, six weeks in the summer. Uh, so generally only faculty-led programs run over the breaks, over the summer break and the winter break. There are a few over the spring break as well. Um, and these are programs where people, where students pay uh, SDSU tuition as normally, and then they uh, enroll in an SDSU course. And that course is taught by an SDSU instructor or uh, a couple of instructors. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity that's a short term experience a shorter term and uh, and uh, a little bit of a, uh, a merging of an international experience inside of an SDSU uh, academic and cultural context uh, or milieu, if you will. Uh, so uh, we see uh, and these faculty led programs fall into a few different categories. Uh, we call them global seminars. This is a large number that have different types of courses. They range in different uh, uh, destinations and different uh, 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 structures. We also have uh, embedded courses, which means it's a, a student takes a course during a regular semester at SDSU, and then they simply travel uh, over one of the breaks, summer or winter, and then we also have what we call trans-border courses where students take an SDSU course and then travel to uh, Baja California uh, here more locally in our region, so across the border. Uh, and we have a representative who's participated in multiple program types here, exchanges and faculty led, uh, 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 Paula Moreno, and I'll let her introduce herself. Welcome, Paula. Hello. Um, so I'm Paola. I was very fortunate that I was able to study abroad twice. I did a back-to-back -back study abroad program. Um, so I went through at the Weber Honors College to Finland where I studied um, refugee and asylum resettlement for the summer in Finland. And afterwards, I went to Italy through the CSUIP. Um, I studied in the Florence Center and the Academia di Belliati, which was the actually the first art university in the world. It was created for Michelangelo to teach. So it was very incredible. It was such an amazing experience that this was offered through SDSU. Um, and in my time there, everything was about art, learning Italian customs and language, which was a lot easier than the Finnish language. Um, it was absolutely amazing that I had the opportunity to study my career, my passion. Um, and it was such a wonderful experience of being able to see firsthand everything that I had studied for so long at SDSU. Now I had the opportunity to see it in person um, in Florence. Thanks, Paula. Uh, and now we're, uh, we'll move on to 
uh, some of the questions that we have for our panelists and have a bit of a discussion. And I should emphasize that uh, many of you that are attending our session today, uh, we know you have some of your own questions, maybe some things uh, pop into your mind and some curiosities while we have our, our conversation here. So we want to make sure that we provide some time at the end for you to ask your questions of us. And uh, we have the Q&A feature here in the webinar today. So uh, please, by all means, uh, add your, your questions to the Q&A feature here in Zoom. Um, okay, uh, so why don't we, uh, why don't we shift and, and uh, we're, what we're going to do is uh, uh, take our questions kind of in following the life cycle, if you will, of a study abroad or the international experience from the outset uh, to uh, preparing to return and returning to SDSU. So uh, hopefully all of you get a, a snapshot uh, of what that uh, experience, that journey if you will, looks like and sounds like. So let's start with the, the preparation and getting started. Um, for, uh, for both of you, uh, Grace and Powlett, um, are, do you have any thoughts to what you wish you had known prior to uh, studying abroad now that you have all of this experience and you're continuing to seek out international experience, what you wish you had known and, and maybe what you wish one of us, myself or one of my colleagues uh, had, uh, uh, had uh, advised you about prior to leaving. Any thoughts there? Um, I would say that it's very important to know that you, there's so much you will not know. Um, and there's so much you cannot prepare for. So I think it's very important to go with a very open mind. Um, and I think when you arrive at wherever you're going, I think you're going to want to um, do everything all at once. And you're going to think, you know, you're going to want to go into, if you're doing an internship, go into your placement and um, start putting your own ideas into it. I think it's important to take some time to just observe um, rest in the beginning, especially, um, be slow to, um, ask questions and, um, yeah, I think it's very important to ask questions, but also just take time to observe every day, um, and just adjust because there's so much to learn and also, just know that you will mess up, you will have hiccups, um, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, and adding that, um, adding to that, I think for me, I wish I would have given myself more time because it was a lot of planning, especially since it was at the same time I had to um, do everything for Finland and Italy. And there were so, because there were different programs in different countries, it was extremely complex. Um, but I think if, you, if you're starting, number one is attend all the sessions. I remember I was always in line for the study abroad advising, whether it was at UOP or the global office, or if I saw a poster, well, now you can't do that. But on campus of seeing there was a session, I would go to it and hear from other people. And I think that's very important because I myself didn't believe in studying abroad. I felt like that's a fantasy, that's a dream. I don't know how I'm going to do this, how I'm going to fund this. And hearing it from advisors of hearing this is how you'd be making your dream a plan. And hearing it from other students, that is such an important thing because you start to realize I can do it too. I can plan too. And you start to make it a plan. And that makes it easier with your family of saying, I'm going to go and do this and that. And here is, and I'm going to be safe. And here is how I'm going to budget. And you start making it real. So I think it's very important that you inform yourself first of all the options, all the possibilities, all the scholarships and programs, because um, that's really what's going to create your foundation and make everything easier from there. 
We have a question related to planning um, from um, some of the participants. One student asked, how far ahead do you need to plan to study abroad? And I was wondering, um, you both did very different types of programs, but from the very beginning of when you were researching options to when you were applying to when you were getting your visa and all of those steps, what, what did that look like for each of you? Well, at least for me, because I, I was doing two, I think I did a year of starting to look into what do I want to do? I took a semester of what country do I want to go to? Do I want to learn a new language? Do I want to go somewhere I speak the language? Um, I did a faculty-led program in Finland. That also was a very full, a key part where do I want to do GEs or do I want to go and major? Do I want to go with a teacher? So I spent my first semester just kind of like listening of what were the options and deciding a country. And the second semester, that one's why it was all preparation of how am I gonna write my essays for scholarships, how work attending all the workshops possible. Um, so it took a long time for me. Um, I'm financially independent, so that was a key factor for me of how am I gonna make all this happen alone. And as a woman, you know, it's also kind of scary and you're afraid of that because, um, you know, we hear all these bad things and it's, it's not like that in real life sometimes. Um, so I did take a lot of time to plan accordingly. Yeah, um, I'll add to that. I originally thought that I wanted, I always knew I wanted to study abroad. Um, I originally thought I would do a semester abroad. Um, but as I started looking at other programs and um, was kind of planning out um, my courses to graduate, uh, I just realized it was a lot more plausible for me to do something over the summer. Um, and so I started looking into that at the beginning of the year, like in um, probably September of the year before I studied abroad. Um, and I believe the application was not due until about February, but it was nice to have that time to do research um, and yeah, just prepare for, you know, the application and um, look at different programs and what I thought would be best for me. Uh, shall we take a couple of, of financial questions and then maybe we can go and, and uh, Jessica, we can look if there's a question or two in the, in the, uh, from the audience that is relevant here. Uh, do you feel like uh, you both uh, budgeted appropriately for studying abroad and, and thought about uh, the different uh, costs that are involved and uh, started early enough, I suppose, with your budgeting and saving and, and all of that? Uh, of course, there's living expenses to account for and personal expenses and different types of travel expenses. Um, do you have any thoughts about budgeting appropriately? I can start with that. Um, so budgeting is very, very important because you don't want to be the person saying abroad crying, calling your parents saying, I lost control. You really do not want to be that person. And you know, my first experience in Finland was very different than when I was in Italy because it was the first time I was outside. I'm from Mexico, so it was the first time I was outside of the US or Mexico. I, it was the first time I did not speak the language. It was my first time using euros, so that also was weird for me, right? I had a general idea of how much things cost, but it wasn't like if I see it, saw it in dollars, or I knew immediately what it meant. Um, so I had a bit of a difficult time adjusting. And you know, a lot of times you will discover when you're in Europe, my budgeting thought was if we were having a field trip or if we wanted to do this or that with friends or classmates, I always thought, is this about the same price as going to Disneyland? <laughs> you know, it, most of the time it was. I remember in, in Finland, we took a boat, we took a ferry and went to a, a country next door to Estonia for a weekend. And it was the same price as going to Disneyland and that blew my mind how it was a different country and do you know that's something you have to figure out 
very early on, how much do I want to spend on going other places? For me, museums, now I was an art student, I had to go to museums. That was my main concern of how am I gonna pay for this? How much do I want to go out, like eat out? Sometimes you have to be strong and say, I can't go out tonight, you know? No, thank you, I'm okay, I'm cooking, I'm buying my food and if you want, we have, you know, I did that with my friends a lot where I would invite them and we would all bring something and we would have a small little like gathering at my place. And that was very sweet. So at the beginning, you do have to be very disciplined and have that in mind because sometimes you hear, like I have friends who said, I'm traveling to all as many countries as possible. I'm going to six countries this month. And you know, you want to be them, but you can't financially. And being honest with yourself and saying, that's not me. I cannot do that. I cannot afford this. I came for, my, for me, Italy. I want to stay in Italy. So that's a big part of it, of being honest and being mindful of yourself, of very looking deeply inside of you and saying, no, not this, no, I want that. And that's what I'm going for. That's how I'm spending my money. Before we move on to the student experience part, we want to hear a little comments about your experience. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, just very briefly, uh, the scholarships that you receive? Because I think that's important for, uh, for everyone to hear. Yeah, I, if you don't mind, Grace, I got a lot of scholarships. I, I can tell you I had almost everything covered almost everything. That for me, oh, I cannot thank the advisors at SDSU enough for making my dreams possible because I got um, the Gilman Scholarship, which is very, very important. Do not study abroad and not apply to it. You have to. Um, and that was $5,000 that went directly into my bank account. Um, I got a stipend from the ICEP when I did my Finland program, which I received a cash when I was there. That was very different for me, you know, getting somewhere and being like, hi, I'm here for my scholarship and then handing you an envelope. Um, I got the, the Weber Honors College um, scholarship for study abroad. I used all of my financial aid, so everything applied, my Cal grad, my Pell grad, um, there's some specific SDSU scholarship I received, an EOP scholarship. I applied to everything possible. And you know, this doesn't happen. Scholarships are real, but you also have to invest in them. You have to, you cannot sit down and write an essay and think, okay, I'm done. No, <laughs> it's a process, you know, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. I remember specifically with the Gilman scholarship that I went to workshops, I went to advisors for them to read my essay. Does it make sense? Is my grammar correct? And that's how you make it happen. It's a lot of um, hard work. I can't describe it any other way. It's an entire process. But trust me, like if you follow it, I got almost everything covered and it is like, it is possible. Thanks, Paola. How about you, Grace? Yeah, so um, I was so lucky, thankfully to our um, amazing donors. Our program was fully funded. So we had funds allocated for everything, um, a place to stay, food, um, travel fare, which was amazing. And I know as well as I think most of the people I traveled with were very determined to um, not spend any of our own money and that was very possible um, we had to be mindful of that especially since we did want to travel a little bit on the weekends and such but um yeah if you are able to find a fully funded program or a scholarship um you can totally allocate your funds to, um, to do what's most important to you while you're there Grace, why don't you talk a little bit about the application process for your program? Because like Paola's, you know, you had to work very hard and, and do a lot of preparation for, for your essay um, because it was a fully funded scholarship. Um, just like Paola received a great deal of funds to cover her experience, it's not something you can just kind of quickly do and then boom, you, you get that scholarship. You have to really work for it. So why don't you talk about um, how you went about yours for the Cambodia program? 
Yeah, so um, this opportunity, when I found it, I was like, this is amazing. Um, I really want this and I wanna make sure that I deserve this. Um, so I reached out to my history professor who I knew, knew a lot about um, the history of Cambodia. And I kind of just asked him all about the country, the history, uh, the culture. And I was like, I, d I put in my research, I did my time. Um, I really thought about what the education placement would look like um, and how I would be able to adapt. And so I did spend a lot of time on my essay. Um, I asked professors and I had a lot of people help me out. Um, and yeah, I definitely put in a lot of work, but it was so worth it. And then also there was an interview process. Um, so yeah, that was also really important to prepare for um, because you want to go in knowing your stuff. You want to go in showing that you are really dedicated and you know that um, to earn a position like that is uh, a big deal and a big responsibility. So you want to be able to step up to that. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Let's uh, kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about your experience when you were abroad or a little more about researching before you went. So as you were looking at all these many different types of programs, um, what types of things were important to you as you were doing your research? I mean, yes, academics, um, but what other, is there parts of your religion or your diet or where you were going? What kind of research um, were you doing in preparation for choosing your programs? And I can go ahead and start with that. Um, for me, I come from a long line of teachers. And growing up, they were always like, Finland this and Finland that. Um, for you guys that don't know, Finland is what has been for a long time the number one country in education. It has bounced between like one and like three along the, the year. Um, so growing up, I heard so much about Finland and how wonderful it was. And when the Honors College offered me the opportunity to study abroad with them in Finland. I, I had to do it, you know, I, it was just something that I had grown up for with so many years that I wanted to live it, especially, you know, um, I, I went during the summer of 2019 and our country, the US was suffering a lot of racial issues, um, it was a star, a lot of different things. And I was very interested in hearing how Finland managed their um, immigration policy, especially refugee and asylum resettlement. Um, with refugees, I think nothing breaks your heart more than when you actually speak to these people and they tell you about all these heartbreaking things that happened in their country and they basically just flee um, it was so, there's no words for it. It was just so impactful. Um, and that was the reason I wanted to go. I wanted to live that experience that I had heard for so many years, especially about this topic that's so delicate. Um, and then with Italy, I fell in love with drawing, you know, especially as a Mexican growing up in San Diego. I used to commute back and forth every day. And I was never tall, I'm a pretty short girl. I was never really skinny or blonde or had blue eyes. I was never the typical Californian or American. And I had a professor that she just told us, you have to stare at this model for three hours and portray them and you really find the beauty in them. And so I fell in love with it. And Italy for me was the birthplace of the Renaissance. It was just the place for me to become the Renaissance of an artist. So it was a very selfish reason to go, wanting to grow for myself as an artist. Um, so I chose my programs very 
specifically, even though it was completely different, um, but it was very personal. And you know, when you're at a job interview or when you're talking to someone, you don't want to say, oh, I'm passionate about this. You want to talk and for them to say like, oh my God, you're really passionate about this topic by the way you speak. And when you see, for example, the David of Michelangelo, you know, I've studied it years and years and years. And when you were there, it's just impressive. It's 17 feet and it just blows your mind. And you're talking about that or whatever your topic is. When you're surrounded by people who are as passionate about what you are, you just explode with it. And that's what happened to me. And that's what I, before going, that's what I hoped would happen. And it did. Um, so that was why I chose that program specifically. Yeah, so um, I was drawn to this program a lot because it is, I wanted to go somewhere that um, was very different from my context um, and be able to apply what I have learned to a different context. Um, and I think I was really excited because, you know, you learn, you'll hear this a lot in your uh, classes in college to think critically about, you know, your own culture and other cultures. Um, and I think the best way to do that is to go to a context that's very different from your own um, because you come back with a different perspective on your own. Um, and that's an experience I really wanted to have. And I was also drawn to this program because it's very hands-on. Um, it wasn't like taking classes, which would, is amazing, but um, I actually got to um, be like working and contributing to the community. And that was just amazing. So how did you both engage with the host, the host culture? How were you involved on campus or with your other, other people in your program or with your local community? Yeah, so um, for me, I mean, I think the biggest thing was my students. Um, it was difficult to uh, go from teaching in a school in the US to um, teaching in a school in Cambodia. But I was very determined to um, build relationships with the students um, because I think that is the basis of um, any education um, requires some sort of respect and rapport between the teachers and the students. Um, and I knew that that would be difficult just because of the language barrier. Um, you know, I'm coming in, these students don't know me. Um, so I had to gain their trust and um, be very open-minded to them and get on, get on their level, you know, um, like play with them. Um, you know, it, the school looked a lot different because there was a lot of um, rough and tumble between the children, it's very, open and that's how they play and they look out for each other you know they never hurt each other but um I was I just was like I need to dive in and um get involved with them and that was the best way for me to um show them that I was there to be with them I was there to engage with them um and do things their way You know, for me, I, I had a really rough time in Finland because I did not look like Finnish people. Um, and Finnish are very, very shy. They're, they won't talk to you. They will just stare at you and wait and hope that you will come and speak to them. And, you know, for me, that was very strange. You know, you have people just like, you know, come down like, hello, like you can say hello. Um, <laughs> and I had a really rough time at the beginning because 
I had never experienced that. And that was a huge culture shock. Um, and at first it felt like they were being a bit hostile or they weren't, I didn't feel accepted. I felt judged because, you know, I didn't know that was normal for them. Um, it wasn't until I spent more time with, with made Finnish friends that I, they told me like, oh no, like we stare at you because we talk among ourselves, like trying to figure out where you're from. And like, they told me we made bets of who could say hi to you, but nobody could. So we just like hoped one day you would come and like look our way too. And you know, that was so fascinating for me to hear. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, you have to have the courage. And even though first time I made Finnish friends were, I don't know if I'm gonna be accepted. I don't know if I'll be able to speak with them. Like I didn't know if they spoke English. Um, and you know, that was very challenging, but you have to have, you have to build the courage and just approach someone. And that blew my mind. You know, they were so nice, so kind. A lot of them spoke Spanish to me, which was insane. I was not expecting that. And you know, we used to bike around everywhere. Um, and you know, when I went during the summer, there was no night. So imagine this, it's 2 a.m. and then it looks like it's two in the afternoon. Um, so that was very nice where they would show me kind of their country and showing their customs and food. And that was very, very lovely. But it was, that wasn't until the end. Um, so it's challenging at the beginning. In Italy, I, I went through that too, where I wanted to get close, but I didn't speak the language and they did not speak English. So I felt like I had no personality at the beginning where I'm learning the language, but I can't be funny because I don't know how to do it in your language. Um, and there was a whole process and you know, in Italy that I had the issue that people would look at me and be like, you're not American. They would just speak Spanish to me. And so I also wouldn't practice because of that. Um, and it was a very hard transition to kind of realize I have to eat like an Italian. I have to dress like an Italian. I have to, you know, they have all these mannerisms and just the way of their posture. And I want it, I really, really want it to feel a Florentine. You know, I, my whole, the CSU program emphasis was for you to become a local. And I really, really wanted that experience. And, you know, it was a hard process, but at the end, I really love the story. Um, I, I was in Italy when the whole pandemic started. You know, when you get that, notification that you have 24 hours to leave the country what do you do at that time and you know for me I went for the art you know I wasn't gonna let this pandemic stop me and I remember I put my best like Florentine outfit and even though you know my school was one of the last five American schools remaining in Florence that we were still in Europe when everything happened and, you know, I remember I walked into almost all the museums in Florence and they were empty. You know, there was no one there. And during this time, you could not enter if you were not Italian. Like, you had to be Italian. You could not be a foreigner. And nobody stopped me. And I remember the first when I, I went to see the David. And I remember I bought my ticket and I was in front of him alone. And that really blew my mind because it was always crowded and I just sobbed in front of him thinking you know I have to go home and I don't want to and I did that with other museums to say goodbye to my favorite art pieces and I remember going home and walking home that I realized that was the ultimate Italian test nobody questioned I was not Italian nobody questioned my Italian or the way I dressed or the way I spoke like at the beginning you know I had become one of them and leaving that was so hard because it's a process you know you have to be open to it you have to be willing to change yourself and to, trust me once you do it it's so rewarding it's so unbelievable <laughs> also one thing I will add um was I had an in-country coordinator um, who was from Cambodia and I, her name was Sian, and I asked her so many questions 
um, every day. She was someone that I just would be the first person to go to rather than try to figure it out for myself all the time. Um, because yeah, I think it's very important to ask questions and be open-minded. And I ask my supervisor questions all the time. Um, and if I hadn't done that, I don't know how I would have been able um, to really adapt without their help. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we do have some questions um, from the Q&A chat. So uh, we have, what was your housing like um, in your locations? Um, yeah, so I, me and um, the rest of the cohort stayed in a hotel um, for the eight weeks. And well, we switched hotels, but um, yeah, it was really great. There was one weekend um, where we did a homestay and we did a lot of weekends traveling um, that were also funded, but the accommodations were really amazing. And um, yeah, there was like complimentary breakfast. Um, yeah, everything we needed. Um, for myself, Ethan and I sit at their dorms. Um, which was really great because there's a lot of diversity. Um, I just didn't know it at the time for a while, but it was very fun, you know, there was a lot of just students and that was a very nice experience of being able to make friends, you know, we would all eat at the same place. So that made it easy to kind of say hello and interact. Um, and then in Italy, dorms don't exist in Italy. So you have to get your own apartment. And that was a whole experience because you know, you don't speak it. When I arrived, I could understand in time, but I couldn't speak it. You know, that's pretty scary of saying, I have to be completely 100% adult in this, and deciding which agency, what apartment, location, do I want to be able to be close to my school or the other places? Do I want to be, since you no know, save money on this or save money on that. Um, it was very hard at the beginning, but you no, know, thankfully the, the the CSU Foreign Center, which was one of my schools, um, they were so helpful. They would give us an open house of the apartments where we would just walk around Florence and see the different apartments. They had different kind of gatherings for us to meet each other and like, hey, do you want to be roommates? And I'm just like, sure, <laughs> you know, let's live together for this year. Um, and I think for me, it was more rewarding to live on my own because I learned so much about Florence and myself doing so, you know, being responsible, you know. It was also quite fun, you know, my agency knew me, you know, they were, I was always wearing a snow jacket when I would go with them because I was really cold um, and they knew me, they were, they became, we became friends and that was a nice experience of them telling me, oh, you know, by your apartment, there's this and that, there's this event going, you should check it out. Um, also, you know, I had in Florence, um, there's like the supermarket and then they're kind of like organic markets, which is kind of more customs where you get fruit and vegetables. And you know, the people saw me so often that they would start talking to me. You know, on Christmas day, I remember the guy that I would always buy my vegetables from, he gave me a couple things and said like, have a very nice like Christmas because I, I know you're not from here. I hope you're not spending it alone. And you know, that was so sweet of seeing kind of other people's reactions as the months went on to me, how they became very warm and inviting and just so nice. Um, it was so different than where you have lived in the dorm with other students, you know? You also grow a lot as an, like as an adult, you have to become one, you know? Um, it was absolutely, I feel that's what made me feel like a local influence. Thank you. So we're getting, I just want to do a little time check. So we have about seven minutes left. Um, so for this last question, kind of before, I'll ask two questions. Um, and you can choose to answer both or one. How has your international experience had an impact on your future goals or plans? 
Um, and or uh, what advice would you give to someone who is planning or is interested in an international experience? Um, I'll start. Um, I, this experience was like absolutely transformational for me. Um, I think even coming back, um, everyone in my life was like, you are just a very different person, um, more confident, uh, more grounded, um, all of that. And I, as much as I absolutely loved teaching the boys, um, what I really loved about my experience was the one-on-one -on -one time I got to spend with them and show them, you know, that I care for them and that I care for their education. Um, and I think that's really important. And so that made me kind of look at education in a different way and that maybe I wanna help those students who don't necessarily feel that um, their education is super important or that they're cared for in that regard. So um, yeah, it was very informative of my career goals in the future in that um, I'm more interested now in um, like child psychology um, and doing research on the education system and teacher uh, student relationships. And um, I would just advise everyone to study abroad. I know that that is what everyone will say, but it truly, um, I believe is so important and um, it'll change the way you see um, the world and you see your own culture. And um, I think it'll make whatever career path you're going into, um, I think it'll make you better in that field. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice. And to have an open mind, I think a lot of times people um, think, oh, my study abroad it has to look like everyone else's. Um, I have to do a semester abroad in, um, you know, Spain, which is great. Uh, any of semester abroad uh, is great, but there are so many options and so many places you can go. Um, even if it's just a two week program or um, it's an eight week program, just uh, yeah, be open to it. Um, no matter what, it will be a positive experience. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I think you don't understand how many doors open for you after you study abroad. Like for me, a year afterwards, I'm still discovering all the doors that are opening for me. Um, not just for the experience of studying abroad, but as in, like, especially if you, I recommend this so much, like if you take major classes abroad, do it. Um, because it's so rewarding when you're in a place filled with people that are passionate about the same thing as you are, when you're in the city where you feel like, wow, this is amazing. I just want to keep doing it. You will just explode with creativity. You will just explode with that thing that you're passionate about. And then when you come back, people can tell, like it's, it's unavoidable. It's just, it sort of just happens because you spent all this time working for something. And when you come back, you still carry it. It's not like you leave it in that country, you know, for myself. Now, as, as I'm approaching kind of graduation, I have rec um, rec recruiters from very famous companies, like well-known that contact me that say, hey, I saw your resume. Like, I would really love to get in touch for this event or for an internship. Um, please contact me. And I think that's weird, you know, I, I was never expecting other people, especially other companies to reach out to me. I thought it was always like, you have to reach out for them and apply. So that opened so many doors, you know. Every single time I have sent out a resume, I think only once someone didn't reply. I always get an interview because people are curious, what is it that you bring? And you know, in the field of design with my specialty in graphic design, you start incorporating these ideas. Hey, this works in another country. Let's start using this because it works of different things of 
realizing we need to broaden our, especially our, in San Diego, that we're so diverse, our language or the way or having it with icons that way anyone, regardless of language. And you know, these are ideas that sort of just happened because you went abroad, because you learned something somewhere else. And when you come back, people want that. People want to hear from you. People want to see what ideas, the innovation that you come back with. Um, and that can only happen if you take, you're honest with yourself and say, hey, this is what I want to study. This is what I'm passionate about. You know, there would be times for myself, like I said, with drawing that I would sit down and then I would forget about life and myself. I was just me and my model or my statue. And then, oops, like eight hours just passed by. Like it's time to go to bed. You know, it just happens where you just explode with it. And you know, there's nothing more rewarding that you have spent so much time and money on an experience. And then it starts giving back you know, for myself, of I landed my first career job as a student and it's paid, you know, that was incredible. Um, being able, being offered another internship, you know, I, I'm currently waiting, um, I landed a graphic design internship in Paris for this summer, but they just, France just entered new um, quarantine, so I have to wait until next year. Um, but these are all doors that start opening because you had the courage to study abroad. You had the courage to take that first step as a student. And it just opens so many different ways of career paths and just things that you didn't even know about. Um, so it really, really, it's not just about your experience as you're studying abroad there. It's also a lot of what you do when you come back. And I think that's one of the most rewarding parts of it. That I always carry my finished time or my Italian part. You know, it's something that you will forever, like it will forever be in your heart, in your character, in your mannerism. It stays with you. And you know, as you enter your professional or personal life, it will show and people will want to see you succeed because they actually know like you have spent the time, you have been spending so much of it that they just want to hear back and they want to involve you in everything that is going on and how is it that you're going to help other people too. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Grace and Paula. I must say an hour is really not enough. I could probably listen to you talk about your experiences all day long, uh, but I do wanna be mindful of everyone's time. And for everyone who's attended, we really appreciate your engagement and putting all of your questions in the Q&A and in the chat. And we may not have gotten to all of them, but I just wanna close this out um, by saying a lot of these specific questions about the types of programs that you can do, start exploring. This is our Aztecs Abroad database, and this houses everything that's approved by SDSU. So you can play around on here, see the different locations, the different types of programs for majors, and then hopefully we are crossing our fingers that you're gonna make the decision to join us at SDSU and become an Aztec for life. Uh, so when you do that, um, our offices, Global Education Office, and then Jessica in Cal Study Abroad, you have a lot of people on campus that are gonna help you make your goals and your dreams come true and having an international experience. And so this is where you wanna start exploring, start imagining. Um, I love Instagram. We have an Instagram you can see at the bottom of our header, SDSU Global Education, and then calabrod.sdsu. Um, go ahead, start following us. See, um, get that curiosity peaked even more. I mean, I know it already is because you're in this session and we just wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, so if you have more sessions, uh, enjoy the rest of Explore SDSU and um, we'll see you on campus since most of things will be in person in the fall. So we're excited to get to know you and thank you.